Welcome to the Delling Pod with me, James Dellingpole. And I know I always say I'm excited about this week's special guest, but I really am excited. Uh, I, I've been I've been lining up or, or hoping to have Stephen Wilkinson, or rather Sir Stephen Wilkinson, on the podcast for for quite some time. Um, and I heard you, Stephen, on uh, the podcast of my good for our good friend Tim Price, and that was what about three or four months ago. Yeah, I've been on on Tim's podcast twice. Once in the summer of 2019, I think, and and last oh no, three times. We had a um, we had a Brexit evening roundtable which yeah. was a lot of fun in Tim's flat in London on the 31st of October when we thought we were going to go um, go to get over the finishing line, um, but then didn't. Um, and then again, I think you probably heard me about uh, four months ago, three months ago, end of the last year. Yeah. And something like that. So, so okay. So we're talking about, so it is now what, what what's the month now? It's the beginning of March in 2021. March. And... Three months ago, four months ago, f- things were things were feeling pretty bleak, but I don't think we had any idea then just how bleak they were going to get by now. Um, we can talk about that in a moment. First of all, I want to introduce you to everyone um, because the first thing that struck me about you is that you have a beautiful, a beautifully modulated accent you're probably you're probably the the most nicely spoken person i've had on my podcast i I, i'm sure there are other other contenders but is that are are you are you actually from quite a a a smart background or is it just you just talk i don't know Um, um i am from a a business background my my grandfather and father both were both commercial men and my grandfather was a pioneer in the development of the UK television industry in the 1940s and 50s. Right. And um, and as is the wont of all reasonably successful commercial families, they wanted you know, they wanted to move their children up the ladder, so they sent us to better schools than they went to. Yeah. Um, and I think that probably has something to do with it. I have a um, I have a theory about that, um, about why business people should not pretend, should not aim for squiredom um, with their children, because the business model of aristocracy is an entirely different one to the business model of the, of commercial people. Um, one is based on things staying the same and not making changes, and the other one is is predicated on making changes very, very often and rapidly. Um, so as as business people educate their children to, to be sort of semi-aristocrats and squires, they in fact take out the very thing that makes them successful in the first place, um, which is always very, I found this an interesting observation. But yeah. if that if if that's the if that is if you're hearing that, then then I've probably had the Lancastrian no. beaten out of me, although I don't think I ever had it. No, it's really look, the thing is, I'm I'm slightly worried that we've only got an hour roughly, and there are going to be so many tangents I want to go go on. This this was exactly my thought when I heard you on that podcast. I thought Stephen's a really interesting bloke, and you, you know you are you're you're <laughs> cultured. Uh, you you've got that very interesting combination of having a kind of literary sort of poet poetic brain. At the same time, you come from the world of, of business. We're going to talk about that more in a moment. But that point you made just then is so bloody true. My grandfather, who who sort of built up our family nuts and bolts business, actually, no, he inherited it. He inherited it from his, his father. So, so the family nuts and bolts business was established by Grandpa Dellingpole. I don't know whether he was privately educated, but he was basically Midlands, you know, Birmingham. Um, yeah, probably probably lower middle class. Then my grandfather took over the company and 
at each stage of, of, of uh, each generation, each generation went to a smarter public school. school. So uh, by, by the time it got to me, I went to Malvern and I went to, you know, I went to Oxford. Being prepared exactly for that kind of effete, squirearchical background. And then <laughs> the icing on the cake, I sent my son to Eton, to Eton where he is now completely he's born to a, a life that basically he can't we can't afford i've given him all the taste you know he he shot his first well, grouse in, in well, a bus next to me last year <laughs> there is the additional problem that um th th your children's friends all have houses that own them rather than owning their own properties um which makes life very complicated what, what do you mean by that houses that own them well, if you own a pile out yeah. in Yorkshire um, yeah. with uh, 60 rooms, you don't own the property, it owns you. Yeah, that's true. And, 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 and the, the weight of ancestral responsibility groaning on the shoulders of the, the scions of, of the owners of these large houses you know, eventually crushes them. Yeah. Um, but if you've, got a, you know, if you've got a square kilometer of lead to put on the roof, <laughs> at whatever the current LME price for lead is, that, you know, that most people that don't earn that much in a lifetime. Yeah, to, yeah that's so absolutely the true. House owns you, the house owns you. You have an asset that is wasting um, and that requires enormous upkeep and you, know, you can't get rid of it. Yes. Yes, and also I I once I made a, a documentary, a TV documentary. I, I I thought this was going to be the beginning of my of my TV career, but it wasn't because I'm just not I'm not suitable. I mean I'm I'm too much of a kind of well, the fact that here I am completely outside the mainstream media now. I think I think this this was this was not in your broom cupboard. In your broom cupboard, yeah, it wasn't meant to be. Um, but that point you made about um, you, you've got the generation that, that makes the money, the entrepreneurial generation. And you see this with families like the Rockefellers, where you've got this, the patriarch, who is a man of a ruthless, but very good businessman. And then by the time you get to the second or the third generation, this is the generation that inherits the foundation or, 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 or is a, on the board of the foundation. And the foundation always espouses or almost invariably espouses causes which are inimical to the business of doing business. They're all about sort of liberal lefty woo and about undermining, uh, undermining free markets and all the things that, that, that make, us, make us prosperous. Do, do, are you with me on that one? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, there, there is a, and it, it has to do with, with sort of the slow gentrification and the rejection of the very things that made them successful in the first place. Now, there are plenty of families who manage that transition, but they, it's, um, but most of them don't. And if you, I, I think the statistic is something like three or 5% of all fortunes actually make it intact to the third generation or to the end of the third generation. And that has, that has an enormous amount to do with an understanding of how transgenerational wealth has to be managed and, you know, and, and, and the structures that are required and the education that's required. I mean, I tell my children that, um, that one of the, you know, my, my boys are, I don't know whether this is a UK thing as well, but my boys in a way that is that we never ever thought of are completely obsessed with um, with their bodies and doing bodybuilding and and going to the gym, um, and and I you know I was said to them, uh, having money, inheriting money is very much the same as as training with weights. You just cannot give children, young people, anybody uh, in their twenties or thirties or forties, access to capital and the responsibility for it without training. You know, if you give somebody a, I don't know, an 80 kilo weight and tell them to lift it or hold it, they just can't do it. So if, but you need, you know, training over, over a long, long period of time in order to manage the responsibility of it. And, and, and that doesn't happen very often because money, 
and the you know the, the rules governing how capital works how it's accumulated the difference between capital income just setting up simple structures for managing money are just not things that most families talk about they just don't and so where are the children supposed to learn it you know they have to guess it or make it up or um, but there is very little education and the very best families that manage transgenerational wealth they know this and they educate the children from from a very very early age in in just the way money works that simple they, they train them as as capitalists and that's the only way to do it now aristocrats have a different business model because most of the you know if, if you if you own land and forests and forests will grow whether you have a debauched um lord of the manor or a, a thrifty one it doesn't make any difference the forest will still grow and but and it needs and those assets need managing over generations rather than every year um but the principle is the same yes yes you don't want you you as long as you hold on to your land and you don't sell portions off that's 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 the beginning of the end isn't it when you start eating into your capital yep it is um and i'm sure that's a topic we'll get to later the difference between income and capital that has now been entirely eroded there is no difference between income and capital anymore yeah the, 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 there's, but we'll get the, to that later yeah. i'm sure we'll. There's, there's an annoying dog here and i'm just gonna once it's, it's i'm just gonna get rid of the dog because it's annoying me the dog's annoying me Right, the annoying, annoying dog. Do you dog. edit things? Do you edit things like that out of your no. out of the conversation? No. Do you just, can't do you be, just do you just let it run just warts, can't, warts and all? I can't be asked. You know, the, the thing is, um, Stephen. I, I mean, look, look how we've we've gone into this already. You've got loads of really interesting stuff to say, and people still really have no idea who you are or or why you you know why I'm talking to you. Um, this is this is my problem that I just kind and, and you notice this as well. I'm dying to find I'm dying to find that out. Well, before I'm dying to find that out myself. Ah, good. Okay. Well, before um, we did this podcast, you you being familiar with my my oeuvre <laughs> sent me an email saying, I know you don't do any research for your podcasts. So Here's a thing you might want to read. And it was very helpful, but it, it was a, basically a primer on, on Stephen Wilkinson. And it gave me some background stuff that I didn't, I didn't know. It reminded me that your company is called Good and Prosper. Good name, by the way. Good and Prosper. Good. I, I've got that right, Thank haven't you. I? I haven't invented that. Um, you have. And, no, 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 and, you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I thought that was very clever of you. I, I reckon that... I sometimes complain, you know, given that you, one of your, your, your job basically is, is advising people how to create a good business, isn't it? In a nutshell, it's, it's it, it, in a nutshell. Yeah. And if you were advising me about my business, which increasingly is podcasts and vidcasts or whatever you want to call them. I know that there would be things you'd tell me and you and, and there are things other people tell me. They're things like um, try and make it clear at the beginning who you're talking to and, 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 and write some better blurbs, some sexier blurbs about who they are and get better equipment and do this and do that and do that. The problem is that, and I'm sure this was, was a problem with you with your early career. Um, I just, the thing I enjoy doing is the chat and I like the ideas. Um, and I love the idea that I might be able to monetize this, but the actual stuff like marketing and, and the technical aspect of it just doesn't excite me as much as the actual execution. So I think that my content is absolutely bloody brilliant. I just think, I don't think anyone does better podcasts than me. I just, I listen to the other, other stuff and I think, yeah, you're right, you're right. But actually, your questions are a bit shit, and there's no, they're, they're not really good conversations, and and you're stilted. You know, there's a there's a much more successful podcast than me, and and 
they get good guests, but they're just the questions are really dull and and it's there's no there's no kind of danger or excitement there anyway um why am i why am i saying this um i don't know i'm would, fascinated would you like me to comment on that yeah go on yeah comment you you do good comment i will tell i i will because I, this is reasonably early on in our conversation so i will tell you that the reason that i love your podcast mm. is because you are one of the very few people who has taken a consistent what brave position but i'm not quite sure whether that is because you have the skin of a rhinoceros you genuinely don't give a toss or you are deliberately drawing the fire um, or the enemy fire in in order um in order to um test it yeah but you are one of the very, very few people who has been consistently, bravely, outspokenly, um, I would say free market, what used to be called, what I used to think was a conservative position, mm. but I now don't anymore. Um, and that is admirable. It really is. It's, it's admirable the way that you have stood up and um, allowed you and put your head over the parapet. A lot of people don't and won't for fear of being attacked um and the reason that i'm delighted to come on to your podcast is because you give me encouragement to say what i think um is true in my own perspective um without hiding and i think that's admirable and more people need to do it Yes, I, that's really nice of you to say that. And and actually, one thing I've one of the things I've learned recently in life is never be offhand when people people compliment you. It's it's actually rude. I mean, I, I used to I used to get embarrassed when people said nice things to me, and I used to go you know, sort of sort of yeah, and 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 the impression you give to the person giving the the the, the, the you, you make you make them feel awkward. And and it's rude because it was sincerely meant, and it's a nice thing, and and compliments are a are, are a good thing. But I think what you say is what you say is true. Um, um, that I don't understand. I I mean, especially this year when I've become increasingly isolated from my the people I used to consider my comrades. You know, for example, the people at the the IEA, the um, Institute of Economic Affairs. I thought, I thought, hey, we're all kind of libertarian-ish, free marketeers. We believe in limited government and stuff. And they've completely sold the past. They've just, you know, I don't know, maybe we were, we were 300 holding the, the hot gates at Thermopylae. And, and suddenly we're down to about <laughs> two or three of us and everyone else is just fucked off. And I'm thinking, well, well, hang on a second. You were my fellow Spartans. Yeah, I relied on you. Where have you gone? You know, where is, where's Douglas? Where's, wh where are they all? Um, and people say, like, I, I'm terribly brave, but I don't particularly feel like I'm trying to be brave. It's a bit like, um, it's a bit like when you go fox hunting you know the, the, there's a certain way you're expected to behave and you jump the bloody you, you may not want to jump the, the 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 fence or the or the post and rails or whatever but it's what you do you, you know you're a man or, or, or I mean, girls are just as brave in who who, who who do you hunt who do you hunt with i've only hunted with with a sort of a, a pick and mix bunch of hunts throughout i've never been i suppose my my hunt would be the pitchley um that's that's where i go riding every week with with one of the stables of the pitchley oh, that's, um, that's, that's much smarter than much smarter than my than my time well who where, where, what's your what was your hunt my the, the the pack that I um, that I hunted with um, when I was up at Durham were the um, the Braves of Derwent, which was a, a genuinely hard riding farmers pack, um, and the smart ones were on the other side of the Tyne. There was the Percy um, and a couple of other hunts in Northumberland, but um, 
my regular pack was the was the Braves. I mean, we're going to alienate about about sort of seventy uh, percent of our listeners here by by even mentioning hunting. But but I just think it's it, look being on a horse, going fast over over rough country that you don't know very well in pursuit of a pack of hounds in pursuit of a, a fox is just about i think the 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 most physically hazardous thing you can do outside war isn't it i mean that's what uh image of war without the danger oh, i think it tremendous. was thompson said I, that, mean, I, I i i haven't i haven't been i haven't i haven't been on a horse in uh, for hunting purposes for the best part of 30 years but um um but i I I did it fondly. I had great memories of. But I tell I just what the, I tell you what it what it is, Stephen. It's that you and I are pretty much of an age. I think we're about two years two years apart, and I grew up in a world where. I mean, you know, I don't think I was I, I, compared with some of my friends. I do. I I wasn't particularly privileged. You know, we we were comfortably off, but. I grew up in a world where I just thought that um, I thought that politicians were there to represent our interests. I thought that people in the city were not a bunch of crooks trying to rip you off. I thought I, I thought they were a necessary part of the system uh, to keep the 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 the. the they provided the money to oil the wheels of finer of, of 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 commerce or whatever. I thought that that judges and barristers um, they they upheld the law and that presidential elections when you had a, a U.S. presidential election um, and eighty million people voted for a particular candidate that the one who ended up in the White House in the Oval Office wouldn't be the guy who cheated. And all my everything that I've I've understood about the world, that I I think that man is made in the image of God, that that human life is important. That that um, what else do I believe? I mean that we are the guardians of the planet, but you know we have responsibilities. But that we're not we're not this kind of verminous plague on the planet, which we, and the planet would be well, well rid of us. Uh, I don't believe in an overpopulation. I think Mal Malthus has been discredited on numerous occasions. You know, lots of things I believe that, 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 that really, I think everyone ought to believe because they're obvious and they're true. And yet we now live in a world which has rejected all of this stuff. Over to you. Apparently, apparently, um... There's so much. There's so much in there, and I think at the root of all that you have just described, I think you can you can map it on. I call it our generation is the top left, bottom right generation, because if you take if you take the inflation curve or the um, the long term interest rate as the price of money, when we started off, sort of in the mid '80s. The points of those two curves, inflation and long-term interest rates, were in the top left hand of the core, of the graph. You know, time at the bottom, and interest rates, inflation on the top. And our generation has seen this almost unique trajectory from top left to bottom right. You know, the inflation has gone from, or headline inflation has gone from, I don't know wherever it was. 16 17 percent in 1982 down to um nothing or one or two percent at the current time 40 years later and interest rates have gone from wherever they were in 1982 at the top of the curves i don't know 17 18 percent down to zero and that i don't think we truly understand what that means for an entire generation. We, 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 we really have no comprehension of how, how unique that experience is of effectively massive returns to, to capital at the same time as capital has been increased and debt has been increased because it's just got cheaper and cheaper to borrow. And, 
And I think everything that you allude to, all the, the effects, the societal effects that you have just described, can all be traced to our increasingly decadent relationship to money and our blasé expectation that the experience of the last 40 years, as we went from top left to bottom right, that that somehow is going to go on forever. And it won't, because it's over. You know, that we, we, it doesn't get any, you know, we, we're, trying to, we're trying to force the level of, of interest rates below the zero line at the moment. Yes. And, you know, in some cases it's actually happened. But that is not sustainable. It's not healthy. It's not, and it's not even real. But our experience, the last 40 years, political, societal, has been built on this. It's not an illusion because it genuinely happened. But unless you understand why it happened and why it cannot continue and what the effects of it happening are today, you will not understand. I don't think you will fully understand its corrosive effects on all the institutions of society that whose, whose demise you have just described. Brilliant. So, number one, tell me how it happened. When did it, when did it all go wrong? Was it, um, was it 71 or whatever when, when Nixon finally sort of left the, the gold standard? Yeah, it, 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 it is. And, I, and, and, and I'm going to give a caveat. One of the problems, and if you, if you go down this route that we're about to go down, you end up with a gold standard and a, um, and a hard money attitude. Um, and the problem with hard money attitudes is that you very, very soon get put into this sort of um, this dystopian box where, you know, you, you have, you're decrying the end of the world because, you know, we've lost all our discipline and money's going to hell in a handcart. And, and so I, I'm not in that corner. I mean, I, there's a t I have a tendency to, to wander into that corner to look at it, but I'm, I'm not of that. I'm not fully persuaded. Um, nor am I, uh, I'm not sort of of that true religion. However, I mean, sort of put that caveat up front. Um, it is true, in my opinion, that decoupling money from some tangible anchor, as Nixon did in 1971 in July, marked the beginning of a period in which the only thing holding the value of money where it was, was a trust me attitude. You know, it's the trust me, you'll get it back. It was it, money became debt at that point, obviously. And, you know, the, the way of the world is that once you have, once, once governments found themselves in a position to increased debt without any real cost you know, there was a credit card that was never was never going to come due on their watch and they couldn't really see it coming due any time at all yes and without that discipline um well why why would they stop you know and, and successive governments have 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 expanded their fiat and their their grip on society or their 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 land grab by promising ever more um, munificence um, and distributing or redistributing the gains of the future today, you know, for very obvious political reasons. And, and that is corrosive. It, it's, it's, it's corrosive because it devalues money and money, if money is devalued, it, it has a it eats away at the ethical fabric of a society. And the problem is that for the very first time in history, we seem to have create, we have, we seem to have managed because of the complexity of our monetary system and our economic system, we've sort of managed to um, avoid for the moment, all the perils of collapse that previous coin clipping regimes succumb to 
You know, they, we, we, it's not the first time in history that coin clipping has happened and the currency has been debased, debased but it, it tended to come back and bite the debasers very much faster than this period is. And the problem with all of us who are looking at this and seeing it and saying, but this, this is unsustainable, we just don't know how long this particular phase can be can be carried on into the future we just don't know we're in completely new territory and yes. that makes it so dangerous and it also makes it very dangerous to be a sort of a hard money currency a gold bug because if you know if you had if you had um if you'd looked at this at the beginning of the 1980s and plenty of people did you know, they said we're going to hell in a handcart. We have lost all control over monetary discipline, and we are now heading for an apocalypse in terms yeah. of money and prosperity and and the way that our society is going to develop. And if you'd have taken that position then, and bought your decades worth of baked beans and gone and lived in a cave and waited for the apocalypse to come, you would have been a bit like Peter Cook and and. Um, Dudley and uh, Rowan Atkinson in the first Secret Policeman's Ball, you know, when they were sitting there saying, "Well, this when the base I'll bite it," you know that, <laughs> and and waiting for the end, waiting for the end of the world, and it's just you know you'd have waited forty years and missed the single largest boom in history. And we all look at these markets now and asset prices and the price of property and the value of money and interest rates and thing this cannot go on forever but it seems it seems to be defying gravity which means none of us really know what is going to bring this to a conclusion yes so yes no i was thinking as you were saying that i was thinking all the runes i mean i i'm not a particular fan of jeremy grantham's green politics because he's one of the main funders of um, well, he funds the Grantham Institute, which which puts about the most pernicious climate propaganda, which is inimical to free markets, inimical to to consumers. Um, he's very much part of the problem, but I think he's got his head screwed on financially. I mean, he knows how to exploit a system, that's for sure. And Jeremy Grantham was was, was I was listening to him being interviewed the other day, and he was saying, "Well, we're we're, we're very much due a a major correction." like twice as big probably or we said twice as big but much bigger than 2008 because of course 2008 was never really solved was it on the contrary it, it, we just kicked the can down the road we've been we've been kicking the can down the road since 1987 you know the the, the greenspan's greenspan who was um who's been accredited as being the, you know, the, the, the grand master of, of modern finance, did, you know, he started all this, this um, saving the markets from themselves. And I just started working in the financial industry in 1987. I'd literally been there for two months when the crash um, at the end of October um, in 1987 came. And that was when we started to learn that there was a an, om, an omniscient and omnipresent Federal Reserve that will always come in and save markets from their own stupidity because the political consequence of a hard, fast crash was just too awful politically to stomach. So they had to be saved. And you know, once you started on that moral hazard path, and never forget that the, the size of today's financial institutions is a reflection of the size of sales organization needed by governments to distribute the vast amounts of debt that they have been producing. I mean, ever larger, so they can't let their sales agents fail because otherwise they wouldn't have anywhere to, you know, to, to, to market their, their paper. Yes. So you know, the, the two go hand in hand. Uh, we, we, we can't conceive, a, a trillion is the new billion, and there are many, many, many trillions of, of, of dollars worth of, of indebtedness, and, and the, the, the money supply seems to be expanding at a terrifying rate. Somebody, somebody said to me the other day, I'm sure this is, this is, this is right, that if you spent a million pounds a day 
every day from the birth of Christ, you still wouldn't be anywhere near to spending a trillion, to having spent a trillion dollars. Uh, does that make sense? Probably, I, I'm not very good at math. Well, but... Yes, it, of course it does, because um, you know, 2000, 2000 years times 365 days doesn't yep. give, isn't, isn't a trillion. Right, okay. Well, so, that, so, that, so that it sort of helps, doesn't it? <laughs> Puts, puts it in one's head. So yeah. just, to, just to recap, when you give governments pretty much unlimited power, the, the gold standard was a discipline that kept people honest. The moment you give governments the ability to, to print their own money, you, you're, you're doomed. Always. Because they will always take the path of least resistance. Mm. Always, if there's no disciplining factor, always. Yeah. Um, and you know, one of the things that that frightens me is that um, we we think, and again, this is this top left, bottom right curve. We think, and we have been conditioned to believe that the peace and the prosperity and the ease of our existence in the Western world, which we have experienced over the last 50, possibly even 70 years, although I seem to remember the 70s. I mean, I was a child in the 70s, but I, I remember it as being a, a period very fraught with angst about possible, you know, a, 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 the war that, the next war that hadn't quite been finished um, at the end of the Second World War. So there was still a lot of, a lot of angst around that, which sort of disappeared in the good days once the 80s kicked off. So these last 40 years, maybe 42, 45 years, have, have given us the feeling that this is a permanent and deserved situation, this very delicate balance between a free market economy and a cushioning social net um in a sort of yeah. social democrat with you know, every government we've had has been more or less social democratic and whatever the colors they've you know they whatever they've called themselves they've, they've been social democrats in all but name yeah that balance if it is or that very delicate balance that guaranteed our prosperity has been shifting towards disequilibrium i would say for about at least 10 years. And by disequilibrium, I mean the system has not been working for everybody the way that it was supposed to work. And there has been an accretion of, of, um, of value and of money and of power in an increasingly or a decreasingly small group to the disadvantage of everybody else. Yes. And that is unsustainable. And, and, and I've, the tipping point, I think, has come over the last year um, as, as COVID, for whatever reasons, has been used as a, and I don't even think it was probably planned, but it was used anyway as a land grab to extend the state into ever more areas yeah. of our existence in a way that I believe is inimical to the way of life that we have become accustomed to and it is extremely dangerous. And I've, I believe we are in an extremely critical place at the moment. And that this should have happened under a conservative government in the UK with a 70 seat majority is beyond parody. Yes, I, I, I agree. And isn't one of the most extraordinary things that so few people are acknowledging this? I mean, for example, I, 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 I sort of, I, I, I read the, the Spectator occasionally, and it doesn't seem, you know, th this is a sort of conservative publication. It doesn't seem to be very interested in holding the conservative government to account for not being conservative. It seems to be just sort of going along with the program. And, 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 and this is across the, 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 the formerly conservative media from the, from the Telegraph to the Mail to, to wherever. No one seems to be acknowledging that this is an, well, A, an epic takeover by, uh, well, I think it's totalitarianism, basically. And, and B, that 
we are about to experience the most monumental economic crash as a result of this. Yes. Um, well, can I can I take issue with two of those statements? You do yeah. Um, the this is I would call it numpty totalitarianism because there isn't there isn't any one person with a fiendish plan, you know, a sort of mind Kampf in his pocket, looking to impose a an, a philosophy of order on an errant society that there's that that isn't there the, there's a sort of there's this sort of semi-intellectual um divorce driven these the sort of papers about the future of society that you know that would be hilarious if they weren't quite so um they were they experienced them quite so visceral up until 2020 the the witterings of 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 the world economic forum which had been going on after all since i think he founded it in the early 1970s klaus schwab and every year these 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 bastards have been flying off to 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 davos making their speeches in the snow and and enjoying you know little kind of workshops on on this you know how ordinary people live and stuff and you look at this stuff and you think well this is pie in the sky it's a nonsense they've only become a threat this year They've only become weaponized this this year. So I agree. Uh, and, 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 and under normal circumstances, I, I don't think that I've spent 30 years of my life in Germany. I speak fluent German. I have business interests in Germany. I love Germany. I don't think there is anybody. And the Germans are excellent English speakers. Yeah. They're almost to a man. They are they can they can hold their own in basic English with but i don't think there is anybody left in the country who still speaks with a sort of ridiculous german accent that i thought we only had in peter sellers films in the 1950s as close klaus schwab does i mean the, the man is it's just ludicrous that yeah. this person has sort of emerged like some some um bond villain as, well it, it, it's 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 a sort of Rowan Atkinson Bond villain, you know. If it is, it's the Blofeld for Johnny English. <laughs> and I and I, I listen to him and I think it can't be true. It cannot be true that somebody with such with such an appalling command of the English language can is genuinely sort of thinks that he's directing policy for us, and it's just ludicrous. Um, and as I say, the, the all of these things together in my opinion, are, are signs that um, something is, that we've reached a point at which the world that we knew and that we relied on has now, in all sorts of ways, through the debasement of currency and through our use of debt and, and through, and I'll come back to that point in a second, if I may, mm. we've, we've reached this point of erosion at which the substance of our society is changing. You know, the, the institutions that, are, that you mentioned that are there to sort of look after our interests, they too have been substantially changed through the erosion of what I call the, the ethics of money creation. And, 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 it, and that's at the heart of it. You know, it there is, um, gold standards are not sustainable in a democracy, but democracy is not sustainable without and over time, it just does. It just takes so much longer um, to 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 become corrosive. But I, we are at a point now where the corrosion is eating away at the fabric of what we thought were immutable structures of our social order. So, are you saying that um, the reason, for example, the judiciary can't do their job? Well, let's look at the, the Supreme Court, for example, in the U.S. The Supreme Court is is no longer fit for purpose. It, it 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 got offered the chance to to intervene in the election fraud. It washed its hands of it. You know, it was it was it did a did a Pontius Pilate. Uh, didn't want to know because the judges probably thought well, maybe they were a bit scared of, of 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 the deep state of being executed or something. You know, um, being being Hillary Clinton, something like that. But but also, I mean, these people are with, with exceptions. I mean, I think I, I think Clarence Tom, Thomas is a decent chap, but. 
I, you're suggesting that they've all been corrupted in some way. Well, I, th I think that the our norms have changed to a point at which that is deemed responsible behaviour. Um, and as I say, the, 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 there has been a creeping... Um, as the state expands its power, it, it also it also abrogates to itself the right to protect us from harm and and people get used to that you know, it's one of the sort of invidious parts of, of you know the socialist mindset is that it seeks to protect people from each other uh, from uh, from risk and the definition of what is risky gets extended as the state gets larger and larger. So it's encroaching on ever more areas of what it, you know, what previously were, were deemed to be entirely private matters. Yeah. And that, you know, people like you and me and presumably many of your listeners still feel it's none of their fucking business. It's, you know, that they, they have, we individuals have a very clear sense of, you know, what is, our area of responsibility and where we would like to take that responsibility for ourselves yeah. and we have and as it has been sort of eroded over time because that's what the state does it it wants to protect us from all sorts of risks even risks against which it cannot protect us and that's where it becomes very very dangerous because then it has to start making stuff up in order to tell us it's doing such a good job of protecting us from things that it can't protect us from. Yeah. And, you know, the, and the worst of it is, or the, the, the area that they find most distressing is the free market. Um, because the free market always produces outcomes that by, very, by their very definition are the result of trial and error and experimentation and innovation. And they are unpredictable. And of course, the state, as a an instrument of organisation and order, cannot stand the surprises that come with dislocations from innovation. So it seeks, without actually saying we don't want any innovation, it acts in a way that stifles it. And which is the same way that large companies find it very, very difficult to innovate. And why, you know, for instance, the pharmaceutical industry spends most of its money buying innovative startups and biotech companies because it it knows that within the confines of its own organization it just can't have that sort of disruptive innovative culture it just can't do it so it buys it you know, it pays large amounts of money because it's to absorb them once the risk is is apparent or once the uh, um once the risk has been taken by by others but the state can't do that and hates it um, which is why its instinct is always to regulate and to quash and how st you know, the stupidity of it in a centrally planned economy. And we've had a wonderful, a wonderful, um, if wonderful is the right word, we've had a, a deep insight into what life is like in a planned economy over the last 12 months um, as ridiculous, nonsensical, effects and consequences you know not even second order first order consequences that no central planning organization can ever conceive of because you just can't it's too complex you know they're dynamic systems and you cannot order a dynamic system by 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 ordering it you just can't do it and the great power of a free market economy is is the price signals that it sends out and price signal, that's the genius of this sort of this invisible system is the way that it is able to allocate resources, energy resources, intellectual resources, physical resources through the price signal without any other form of organization necessary. And once you grab into that and start you know, ripping the wires out and thinking we can do this in a we'll, we'll do this in a in a centrally planned way, the, the price signals just go haywire and the system starts to collapse, which is what we have. And all the money that's been spent over the last 12 months, furlough schemes in, in the UK, PPP schemes in the US, is all deficit funding. You know, it's all 
catching the losses that have been made by fiat um, instead of being invested. So this that's dead capital. You know, if you were if you were doing this in a business environment, this would be loss financing. It's gone. The only thing you've secured is its survival. The money is is absolutely gone. It's wasted. Um, yes. And needs to be written off. You know, there's, there's, there is no way on God's green earth that one single penny of this, of this support money is ever going to be recouped. And you know what that says for, for the state of of our finances and for and for the state of the market does yet to be seen. But it's it's very very dangerous territory that we're on. Um, and you know we can. Sorry, we can go take that in all sorts of directions. But well, I know. The moment, I'm very, I'm very conscious actually with you that actually, really, all I need to do is to just point you in a particular direction, and you just you talk <laughs> and blow your bugle. You talk gold. <laughs> your your every word is golden. Just while while I'm I'm fumbling around for to which direction to take you in, just go back to your uh, early days. Um, I was fascinated to read that you studied medieval German at university. A Durham. Yeah, a Durham. Mm. And um, how was that? <laughs> what, 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 what are the works of medieval German literature? What, what... Oh, well, it's all the, the, um, the um, Minnesänger and the, um, uh, the Nibelungen Lied and the uh, and Parsifal and... Um, Walter von der Vogelweide, and it's the origin of, you know, of the the Bardic tradition in in European literature was basically the sort of Frankish, um, the Frankish language, you know, the Bards and the uh, um, and the, I suppose you would call them the the, um, the household entertainers of the royal of the of the various households in um, in that period pre Chaucer. Um, okay, because so is... I, I, I'm sort of, I, I hadn't really considered um, medieval German literature before. I, 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 I think of, you know, the sort of Chanson de Roland and, 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 and all this, the, 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 the French, the French. Um, it's uh, all, the, all the same, all exactly the same time. Is it? Right. So okay, so this is all that, going on. That period. Okay, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, well, so, so this is where, where Wagner I mean, all... I, I, yeah, well, I mean, I studied, I studied German at, um, um at Durham and economics and as a second as a second um as a supporting study and Russian. Wow. German, which German which college which college were you in? Hatfield. Hat oh oh uh, <laughs> your right. isn't your son or Toby's son is it? Yeah, my uh, my son my son's at yeah. Wait, yeah. is he is he at um where is he at Castle uh, or is he Hill Bead Hill Bead. Hills and Bead. H yeah. Um no, no, I was at uh, Hatfield, which is just below the castle. Yeah, yeah, Durham. yeah, yeah. I, I, I love Durham. I, I, I think Durham is one of the few. I mean, I mean, all all academia sold the past pretty much, but Durham, more so than Oxford and Cambridge, I think, has 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 held on by its fingertips to the old values. You, for example, you can still go to Durham and do English, and have a a, a proper English degree without recourse to too much theory bollocks you know theory. yeah you know you, you don't have to well, do post-colonialism and <laughs> I, I the only thing i do remember um and i'm probably going to alienate a great swathe of your listeners is um um my economics tutor it was a rabid socialist mm. rabid socialist i didn't really know that at the time but um when i was there in 1980 i'm going to say 1982 to 1985 Maybe it was 1983 to 1986. I forgot, but something around about that um, was the miners' strike was one of the sort of prominent features in um, um, in the life of the university at the time. It all happened sort of slightly outside um, the town centre, but it was. But I, I remember having a, a professor Needham. His name was. And we liked each other, you know, as and, and sort of looked at each other in the same way that I imagine um, two different species look at each other when they see each other for the first time. I mean, I'm not quite sure who was, you know, whether I was the monkey and he was the human or the other way around, but we found each other 
fascinating for our for the fact that we were from completely different planets and i do remember then even though i had absolutely no interest in economics and i found it deeply boring um particularly because of you know it just didn't seem to make any sense to me being taught by a raving socialist that there was absolutely no mention of business in the curriculum whatsoever we just didn't you know any of the austrian school of economics or, or milton freeman they were they were treated with disdain the only economists of any um of any note were sort of the keynesian school and um and i always and i found that then extremely distasteful because it just didn't seem to make any sense i thought i'd learn about business and how the world worked yeah instead of so you know economic the economics department had already been taken over in the early 80s by <laughs> by proto-socialists yes um, well I, I i i given what you said about money and about you know even before business money is the explanation for everything that is happening in the world right now because of that moral hazard or whatever the the the, the, the seeping corruption which is everywhere now uh I, i'll give you I'll, I'll take you up on that point and i promise i won't labor it but it's really important to me in my sort of try in, in my attempt to understand where we are and what that means for business and for investment. Um, one of the, would you say that saving and a culture of saving was one of the pillars on which our society is built? In other words, the idea of, of delayed gratification. Yes. I mean, if you go back you know, to the Victorians, that the idea of thrift and of of saving yeah. and of of you know the the Dickensian sort of idea of if a man spends earns one what was it earns one pound and spends ninety p he's happy and if he spend if he earns one pound and spends one ten he's unhappy yeah yeah that was from Pickwick Papers I think yeah, yeah. or I'm 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 mashing the quote yeah yeah I know um, I know, I know the one you mean and we can look it up uh, that. That single idea of delayed gratification, I think, is the is the bedrock of the way that our society is built on. That's what we're built on, because every single economic calculation rests on the fact that there are savings which are translated into investments and investment then um, supports consumption, not the other way around. If there is, if the time value of money is zero, in other words, if there is absolutely no reward for saving money, in fact, if you're penalized for saving money, because with, if you, let's say you, you have a paltry interest rate of 0.5% and you're at a marginal rate of tax. So let's just say for the sake of argument, you're paying, you've got a quarter of a percent and then you've got a few bank fees that you have to pay on top of that effectively your capital is is producing nothing so the time value of money is zero so whether you've got it today or tomorrow it doesn't matter you know, it, it's in fact there is and you know as a citizen that there is inflation irrespective of what anybody is telling you because you can see that house prices are going up and you can see that you know the prices of holidays are going up and your medic and, and your medical bills are going up and so you know that there's inflation even though you're being told there isn't any so if the value of your money of the value or the, the value that society imputes to your habit of saving is zero what does that tell you about about you know the the, the behavior that society needs you to exhibit in order to build the savings pool on which investment is from the, which investment is then finance and if you take that away that simple logic of money not being worth anything you completely destroy the entire thinking and sort of mental model of the middle classes and their aspirations yes. and i don't see you know i'm trying really hard to under, to, to to come up with a an idea of how this might work out well but i just can't see it because 
from time immemorial, and I think you heard me come up with my ants and grasshoppers um, fable or my- you know, Do it my again. Self. Well, you know, the, the ant and the, the grasshopper fable is at the heart of, of that, is a picture that we have of, of behavior that we deem right for a stable society. And that is that there are there is a time to harvest and save because we know that winter's coming. And the ants, uh, the, the grasshopper was sitting there during the summer playing his guitar and singing and chirping and laughing at the ants <coughs> who were busy um, storing food in you know their their nest or in their their, their ant hill um, for the winter. And then the winter comes and the um, the grasshopper is starving because it, it hasn't it hasn't made any provisions or taken any provisions for for the winter goes to the ants and the ant says no because we've got just enough for ourselves um you should have done the work during the winter or during the summer when you were sitting there chirping and playing your guitar and what we have today is the grasshoppers are being are not only being subsidized and lauded and we're laughing at the ants but we're making a mockery of them as well well we're taking it away from them so in a society that you know the ant and the grasshopper fable is it's is as old as it is i think i'm not sure whether it's a, a fontaine fable or whether it's an aesop fable but anyway it's an it's an old one and it as all these fables are they it tells us something about the values of our society that we deem important and the erosion of that that simple model of the time value of money being worth something and therefore thrift being worth something. If that is destroyed because we have governments who do not understand that it's not consumption that drives economies, it's investment. Consumption is driven by investment, not the other way around. And every single economic commentator and political commentator over the last sort of years has always pointed to you know, our Western particularly US um, influenced societies and said, we have to, we have to get people spending again. Mm. And it's nonsense. You know, it's just nonsense. They, they are, they are um, burrowing away under the foundations of what really drives an economy. And I find that, you know, th and that in itself is not sustainable. So that sort of moral erosion of making the, the middle class values or laughing at the ants and you know making the promises that you made to them worthless i don't see how that's sustainable i just i just can't see how it's sustainable and it eats away and then we go back to the beginning of our conversation it eats away at the very fabric of the exactly those institutions whose demise you have correctly um pointed out you know and and bitterly um grieved over the judiciary and the political institutions and the banks and yeah I, i'm not even quite at the bitterness stage yet i'm still in the what i the, the kind of gobsmacked stage i think uh, I, because it's it's it all happened so suddenly i, I mean this year is just, has just been uh, the year that any anyone 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 who thinks their head should have exploded this year at what's going on so few so few people have had their heads explode yet i think that a lot of people are in for a very rude awakening just but your point about investment investment is a word that again has been misappropriated uh by by governments to mean just spending taxpayers money on all manner of bollocks but what do you when you talk about investment and how, how it, that should be the driver of the economy not spending what do you mean by that well it and an, an economy's ability to invest is predicated on the savings that it has mm -hmm. and the savings are you know the accumulation of surpluses at household level individuals not spending everything and and keeping capital I'm, I'm just building capital and that capital is then available through various circuitous routes stock market banking system so on for companies to then 
put to productive use in a very simplified model. Mm. And it's the, it's the creation of products that are available through investments that drives consumption, not backwards, because once you have, once you start forcing consumption, you are in fact destroying the ability to make longer term investments in productive equipment and productive facilities, you know, whatever those might be, because they require sort of, they've got a longer runway before they can start producing. But once you start focusing on on consumption, you are taking that away. You are emphasizing the short term over the long term. And again, the the value of money or the price of money was a pretty good clearing instrument for ensuring um, you know, that, that long-term and short-term interests were, were in balance. But if the price of money is zero, more or less, it doesn't really make any difference. You know, it's you are you are destroying the ability of a society to accumulate capital. And at a very simple level, if you are earning zero interest on your money, you have to start depreciating, you have to start using capital to pay your expenses. So at the point at round about zero, gross or net, mm. the difference between income and capital vanishes. It just vanishes. And that is an absolutely central function of capital formation. Capital has to be worth something if you keep it. it ha- there has to be a price for it. Um, and you can you, can, you, can you give me the, the, the idiot's, idiot's um, explanation of that? To, yeah, well, if, let's say you have a thousand pounds and you have it in your bank account and yeah. you decide to save it. Okay. Um, now, in, under, under normal circumstances, there is a general tendency towards inflation, and, and particularly in, a, in, in in today's world, there is definitely one. But in, in in certain you know things that are important to you, there is a general tendency to inflate. Um, so, the the thousand pounds that you have in your bank account today will ipso facto be worth only let's say nine hundred and ninety in a year's time and to compensate for that and to give you some incentive to save your money you will get a rate of interest that will compensate for that plus a bit more and so it's worth your while to Mm. keep your money in its place and you or you could you could take it out of your bank account and you could invest it in 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 a share or in a company doing something productive with it but anyway it's earning it's it's the money is working in the system. If you, and it's available, you know, if all the households of all the James Dellingpoles with all of their thousand pounds, you know, the aggregate of that is, is the pool of savings available to the entire economy. But if you, um, if the price that you're getting is zero, it's, if it's nothing, so you don't get any interest. So you don't have 1,050 or 1,000, mm. 100 at the end of um, a period, but you've got less than that um, because you've had to pay taxes and you've had to pay bank charges, then your incentive to keep it there is is zilch. You know, you may as well keep it under the mattress, which is exactly what governments do not want you to do. And the one way of keeping it under the mattress is to buy gold, for instance. Um, or you could physically take it out and put it under your mattress, which is why banks or the, the system is now moving towards the criminalization of, of cash, making it more and more difficult to take out cash because they want you to keep it in the system, in the bank. Um, now, if you, if you are reliant on that thousand pounds to pay your bills or the interest on it, either you take the 5% that you would have had previously, you know, your 50 pounds, and you use that to pay your bills, or if you're not getting anything, you have to take 50 pounds out of your capital. So you end up at the end of the year with 950. Yes. And that 950 buys you less than the thousand pound pounds that you did have for the start, for a start, but it also buys you less because goods are more expensive. So as you as you have to pay your your expenses out of that thousand pounds, it's eroding all the time. 
So you're consuming the capital and at some stage it will be gone. Um, and inflation and your costs will see to that. And it, as I say, if there is no incentive for you to put your money somewhere so that it earns a proper rate of return, so that your capital is actually working for you, then the whole system starts collapsing around your ears. You know, there, there is no difference between interest and capital or yes. income and capital. And also, it's it's a bit like gangster culture, isn't it? It's 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 like live for today because tomorrow you're going to be dead. It's it, there's there's no. We're all we're all going to have to start thinking like like characters from um, what's that um, that gangster series that I rather enjoyed. I've the names the names gone. The the uh, Sopranos. No 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 no. I'm thinking the one about black black gangs in um in Hackney. What's it called? Um, Top Boy. Oh, I don't. Oh, I love it. I, yeah, I really recommend it. But but <laughs> you know, the, basically, they don't expect to live very long, and it's all about the deal, and it's all about you know the the maximizing the the, the moment because they, because tomorrow is not going to not going to it's not an issue. But but we but we don't work like that. Our entire civilization is built on the idea of of winter of seasons. There's a there's a season yeah. for harvesting, and there was a season in which the harvest that you've saved and that you are not going to plant or the, you, is for planting next year and for eating during the winter. And that's how, that's the entire, you know, the rhythm of, of saving. Now we don't, we're not as, we're not as dependent on the seasons anymore. We're not entirely disassociated from them. We're not, we're not, we're not as dependent on them, but the, the natural rhythm of, of, of the business cycle or of, saving for the future or of of saying there is a time when i'm productive which is my you know my my working life and there's a there is a season when i am not productive in which i'm going to be ant like and take from my saving that's the whole point of it but if yeah if there is no um if if the relationship between money today and money tomorrow is broken at a very fundamental level then that destroys trust in institutions it destroys it destroys the framework and the mental model within which we have which we assume the bargain with the state is has been negotiated yeah you know, it, we're, the state is reneging on its on its promise to the savers that it will at least try to maintain the value of the currency and you know that there is a reward for thrift yeah. and i find it a you know, little short of disgusting to, to to read you know the the, the literature from you know, savings products and and to see how they are they are twisting themselves into you know all sorts of contortions in order to try and maintain that language and that fiction of the time value of money still being um, still being part of the deal when it obviously isn't yeah so we're agreed because the, the historical record shows this that every civilization every country which has debased its currency eventually faces a a brutal reckoning there's going to be a brutal correction it just always happens that way number one number two which makes these these times i mean um this time really is different i think that that probably never before have we had a situation where governments on a global scale have worked against human nature they've they've rejected all the things that we that make us human they've rejected the seasons they've rejected thrift they've created this they haven't been able to do this before because they haven't had the the power at their disposable for example to to abolish pretty much um cash i mean they're close to doing that so we are going to face an almighty reckoning. Um, so let's let, let's have the money shot moment of our of our podcast. Where what do you think is going to happen next, and how the hell do we protect ourselves? All those listening to this, let's, let, what's going to happen soon? Do you reckon? Well, um, the the rational analyst in me says if something can't go on forever it will stop mm. um so 
you know we are we are at a point now where where many valuations particularly of, you know, of, of money bonds the big stuff yeah. in our economies have have stretched their connection to some sort of base valuation to snapping point now i don't know how much stretch there is left in mm. that connection and i have been constantly surprised in the same way that i've been constantly surprised at the political will to keep the euro alive as a disastrous construction um, that has benefited only germany really over the long term it's been a massive deflationary but I've, I've just been surprised at the political will that has been expended and the capital that has been expended to keep that project alive much longer than i would have thought and i've given mm. up trying to predict the end of the euro because you know it just looks stupid um in the same way markets are no longer you know, stock markets are no longer really reflecting they're no longer a price discovery mechanism they are a prosperity happiness index that is manipulated to make sure that you know, everybody is feeling happy clappy because share prices are going up so we're all feeling wealthy why is that important so you all go out and spend because consumption is what the economy drives an economy and it's all you know it's rubbish yeah so i don't the answer is and i'm going to try and avoid answering the question the answer is i really don't know but what I do know is that these are not markets in which I feel in any way comfortable. So there are there are things that um, that I feel comfortable with, and I happen to feel very comfortable with gold and um, silver. Yeah, those are two things that I feel very comfortable with. Because if you look back over the last fifty years, the internal rate of return of gold has given you a yield of about seven and a half to eight percent and that's that's good enough for me you know that's that's I, people say gold doesn't have a yield well as there is no opportunity cost to holding gold at the moment zero because if zero if interest rates are zero and you're not quite sure whether inflation is actually closer to six percent than zero um then the cost the opportunity cost of holding gold is zilch it's absolutely zilch. Um, and I always, you know, gold is God's money. It's God with an L for pound in the middle. Um, so I like uh, that. That's, um, so, it, yes. it, so, so there's the zero risk. And what gold does have, gold has multiple functions. Um, so if you buy a Britannia or a maple or an American Eagle, um, it you're not only buying something that is physical and has historically, even though the economists don't like the fact that it happened, you know, for thousands of years, it's been the default currency of the world. And the interesting thing about gold is that it, in certain times, particularly in coin clipping phases of our history, gold has had an additional, I'm going to call it risk premium embedded into it, which indicates the speed at which or the the risk of of devaluation. So the, it's a there's a an embedded yield component in gold, which is expressed in the price, that tells you how much confidence there is in in the other type of money and in governments. And that yield component has been increasing rapidly over the past ten years. So you're actually getting, you know, an implicit long-term yield on gold that is, you know, very attractive. It's probably going to be double-digit, um, and the gold market is the most manipulated market in the world. So you mustn't sort of look at short-term swings um, in it. But the general tendency over the next five years is going to be upwards. And if there is the currency crisis that I believe we are long overdue, then it wouldn't surprise me to see gold at I don't know, $10,000, because that's where it needs to be in order to absorb, you know, to, to have the sort of convertibility without being deflationary in our economy. So, you know, gold is a good place to be. The other thing that I would recommend anybody who can is to organize some part of their lives as a business. 
And there's a very simple reason for that, and that is that businesses, business operations, are privileged in our society tax-wise. Now, tax codes are, or have been until recently, the, the, the sort of culture of tax is changing significantly. But governments will always give tax benefits to the areas of society that they want people to be operational in. So they give tax breaks to um, real estate because governments want buildings to be built. So they want people to invest in real estate. They just want it. So they give you tax breaks like depreciation charges and stuff that you know you wouldn't have if you, they're just depreciation charges are, they're, they're made up, they're, they're part of the tax code, but they privilege real estate investment if it's done for business purposes. So if you, if you, know, if you build something to, to, lend, to rent it, or if you build a supermarket or you build a block of flats, then there is a, there is a, 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 a net benefit to you from the tax code. The same works for business. Because gov governments really don't understand how business works, but they want people, they know at least that businesses create jobs and jobs are a good thing. So we want to force them. We want to try to get people to invest in them. And um, you and you and I as citizens have a very simple formula, and that is income minus taxes equals what's left over for costs. Okay? Hmm. That's how the formula for an individual works. Formula for a business is income minus costs is what's left, and then you've got then you sort of then you have what's left over is taxable so you're taxed as a citizen on the income that you make and there are very few real deductions that you can you know you can put money from one pocket into another but in a business the government only takes its share from the real costs generated by the business so it would behoove anybody to get on the right side of that equation and to ha have at least some aspect of their lives organized around a business, because you then get all the benefits of being able to deduct costs from income before you pay tax, rather than having income on which you pay tax and then have to take your, your costs. So there's a, there's a very, very simple mindset that you know, differentiates, I'm going to say the one from the 99%. And that is if you think in, a, in terms of organizing yourself as a business, then the world, the world opens up tremendous opportunities. So being in business is a pretty good place to be in times in which through rising public debt, the tax, the tax burden has only got one place to go and that's up. There is absolutely no way that all this tax, all this money that is now being accumulated in debt mm. for deficit spending is going to be wiped out in any way or is going to be tackled in any way other than than um than future taxes yes is, which so, is going to lead to economic contraction which is going to lead to <laughs> yeah a vicious circle of horror so i think i think being in business as you know a small business is is a is one place, if you can, and if you have the, the proclivities to do it and a sort of basic understanding, and it's one of the things that I teach, yes. is, um, is to get over this sort of phobia about finance and numbers, which has a lot to do with the way that maths is taught and has a lot to do with the sort of arcane language that, that, is, that has grown up around business finance, but it's not very difficult. And you know, one of the most beautiful inventions of the last thousand years has been double entry bookkeeping and the balance sheet because it's literally magic it's 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 a magical formula it's a magical tool that if it doesn't take very much to understand but most people don't and it's at the very heart of wealth creation if you can understand the basic principles you are already you know miles ahead of the game and you can stop playing the game that that government wants you to play and start playing the game that actually makes you money.
Yes, actually, um, you mentioned in that that um, that article about yourself you you, you wrote you, that you sent me um, about your your economics education. If if people wanted to learn about double entry bookkeeping and about how to read a balance sheet, is there a is there a book that you can particularly recommend that would just like? Well, I'm writing one. I'm writing it at the moment. Um, <laughs> I'd love to read I, it. Um, but I, I, I teach business owners to become, I, I sort of cheekily call it cultivating confident capitalists because I, I, I want business owners who are very often completely befuddled by this all accounting language and don't yeah. really understand it and abdicate responsibility for the sort of finances other than immediate cash flow issues to their accountants where you know, the very best companies, small and large, they get this stuff. And it's not magic and it's not rocket science um, and it's learnable and I teach it because I believe that that's one way that I can make a significant contribution is by improving the financial fluency and literacy of, I'm going to say, small and medium-sized business owners so that they can play the game properly. Yes. The so the answer is if anybody can go to Good and Prosper and like I'm doing it, I'm starting a new course. I do sort of cohort based learning um, three or four times a year and I'm starting a new one um, on the 15th of April and I'm sort of starting to market that through Good and Prosper in the next week. So if people go to goodandprosper.com, they will find some information. And if they sign up for my newsletter, which I write religiously every week, they they will find lots of information coming over the next four or five weeks about that. That was you know that was that was very well played there. You slipped that in just just effortlessly and also bloody right as well. I mean you know you're 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 performing a service for the world. I was thinking about this that our civilization is being stolen away from us by really evil forces. I would say. And academe is is pretty much lost. You, you, we, we lamented that earlier on that you you can't go to study English literature and actually study English literature anymore, or or imagine high German literature or anything else uh, without woke and, and 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 just general dumbing down, just just diminishing your education. Um, but those of us who know stuff of value and who are keepers of the flame of truth we need to that's i think that's one of our holy missions you know you, you when you when you said earlier about about what you liked about my podcasts and i was thinking yeah it's just like um i mean i don't want to sound like joan of arc here but i feel it's my mission you the the, the those of us who know have got to go out into the world and 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 and, and save the world frankly does that sound weird it doesn't sound weird at all, and um, it's it's quite and it, it's astonishing and frightening to me how um, how much courage it is it takes for people to stand up and and just say no 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 this is not we we never signed up for this we never voted for it this has gone it's gone too far we they tried to screw us over with Brexit, which was in my book almost treasonous the way that that was managed and handled. Mm. Um, it showed a it showed at the end how how well our democracy and the parliamentary system actually functions that it delivered finally, um, despite all the machinations of um, of those who would want, who would have prevented it, um, that you know these these um, outcomes are possible um, and that the will of the of the general public whose whose collective intelligence I have a great deal of respect for you know, I, I, I think that um, that that is the one you know the one thing the, the, the big dividing line either you trust that people will make sensible judgments um, I'm totally asked, with you and, and I find it a I find it un, insufferably arrogant to believe that, you know, that 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 is not the case, because that way lies pure authoritarianism. But yeah. um, I think the 
taking a stand on this and at least explaining it you know i don't i i love debating and i will you know i will take anyone on head on um what i despise is the arrogance and the the fury of the zealots um for whom no other truth is possible other than the one that they have somehow bought into and you know they're, 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 and the whole covid thing you know there's there is absolutely no doubt that this is a vicious disease you know and and in a society that is rapidly aging where there are serious questions about you know the level of our immune systems and how how well we are feeding ourselves and how overweight we are and you know, the, we are we are increasingly vulnerable to these sorts of viral mutations of course we are and I've, I think I said right at the beginning in March, when the lockdowns first sort of reared their ugly heads, if you'd have asked a group of business people, if you'd have presented them with the conundrum, we have this unknown disease, it's a risk, it's a risk mm. factor. What, what sort of mitigation strategies or how could we, how could we combat it? Mm. You would have come up with some pretty good answers and the one that was staring everybody in the face for at least from april onwards was the one that ended up you know, months later as the great barrington declaration and that's that's what if if, if 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 you know if people who are used to dealing with multivariate risk which is mm. basically what business people have to do they have to make hard choices they have to look at costs opportunity costs, risks, mm. and mitigation strategies. And then they have yeah. to come up with a way forward. And the way forward is not, oh, let's shut the business down. Yes. But yes. <laughs> that, that's, that's never an option. No. <laughs> yeah, I know. We'll destroy the economy in order that we save the NHS, which is financed by the economy. How does that work? How does that work? It doesn't work. So... Um, Anyway, I'm not quite sure how we got onto that, but I I believe that standing up and making a contribution, I I can't, I don't have the platform, or I don't have the voice, or or I don't have any of the the qualifications to do what you do, but the I think the the um, contribution that I can make is to teach people how to use the tools of a free market capitalist society in order to improve their chances of winning yeah yeah no, I listen do. i think i think i i would if i were anywhere near being a, a, a business i would be on your on your course like a rat up a drain pipe before we go uh and, and listen i we, please let, let's do another one i mean i'd actually like to do this all over again just covering the same ground but but just taking different routes because you're you're just I could listen to you for, for, for days. I really could. You're, you're fantastic. Um, Thank you. Just, just some quick ones. Um, gold, you're, you're bullish gold. I'm, I'm with you on that one. Um, you're, you're talking physical gold and you're talking probably um, in a vault in what? Switzerland? Well, you know, depending on the, the quantities, um, safe in your bedroom is probably stepping stone number yeah, one. Yeah, but then you need guns for it that. So you need guns possibly. to protect yourself. I mean, if, if, okay. if it's going to kick off as badly as I think it's going to kick off, you know. Right? Well, gold is useless, is useless in the crisis. Because you can't spend it. No, <laughs> you can't. You can't go shaving off bits and go. No, no, you buy. can't. No, no, no. So, so what you what, what if you if you're looking at catastrophe situations? Yeah. Gold is there to be used once order is restored. Yes. Once order is restored, you then sort of emerge with your treasure and then you can start buying productive assets. Yeah, if you're still alive. Having gold forever is just, you know, it, it, you, you can do what was um, Donald Duck's rich uncle, it was Uncle Scrooge. Or Scrooge something. McDuck. Scrooge McDuck, where you can sort of, you can, if that's your thing, you can fill your bathtub with it and bathe in it, but it doesn't, it only becomes useful once the phase once the phase in which it was protecting value has is over, the crisis is over, and you can convert it back into productive assets again, because sure. you know, that's the name of the game. So you're 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 just making sure that when the when the 
when the board, the monopoly board is set up again, you've got, you've got a bag of stuff that you can start using productively again. Now, in, in, if you need to get through the crisis mm. and, you know, money isn't, isn't available or it's hyperinflating or doing something, you, know, you can go pick, you take your pick, um, then a bag full of silver coins, small denominations, you know, a, a year's worth of, of silver coins will get you through the worst of it. And, you know, there are all sorts of other perishables if you don't like silver, there are all sorts of things that, that, that maintain their value. Well, like because cigarettes? You just need to find stuff that... Um, used to be cigarettes. I'm not sure whether they count anymore, but, you know, um, something that's non-perishable and that is easily stored and that is in small denominations, which is why the sale of bullets, for instance, in the United States has gone through the roof, you know, ammunition. Because ammunition has a lot of the properties of gold, it's it's it, it corrodes over time. But sort of for a crisis period, you know, looking at ten years, a box of bullets is still going to be mm. cu currency. It's, you can still use it. You can give two away, or you can give one away, or you mm -hmm. a box away, or, or baked beans presumably would have the same the same basic um, uh, exchange function. But in those sort of times, if if that's what you're planning for, and I don't think it's going to get to that. Um, that would be a useful thing to have. But gold is there as a store of value through the crisis to then be redeployed in whatever currency then turns up afterwards so that you can start buying productive well, assets. Well, on that subject, can you, can you see any element of the gold standard being restored? There's a, a book written by Benjamin Graham, which very few people know, called A Store of Value, um, and that was written as Benjamin Graham. Benjamin Graham was the father of, sort of modern investment analysis. And he wrote the book in 1934 called Security Analysis, which is a great big volume that I've read a number of times. And it's a beautifully written book. And he also wrote The Intelligent Investor at the beginning of the 1940s, which he then published in sort of four subsequent editions, the last one being 1973, which was a sort of you know, the probably the best book ever written on thinking about the difference between investment and speculation. Mm -hmm. But he was a he was a polymath, a genius of a man, and wrote beautifully. And he wrote a book called A Store of Value, in which he suggested that a gold standard would not really be sensible in a modern complex economy. And he suggested a system whereby a central government would would effectively create storage units for a basket of commodities you know they would include wheat and silver and and copper and all the other sort of elements of a modern economy and that would be that basket of 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 goods would be what was backing the currency and gold would be part of that but only a small part of it right um, and the book is is magnificent because it's 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 a beautiful treatise on the nature of money and how to tie um, how to tie a store of value to the issued currency without the very clumsy sort of instrument of of gold, which you know, has all sorts of um, has all sorts of um, disadvantages as well as you know, a number of advantages which everybody knows. But it's um, it's a much more flexible and intelligent approach to the system, and I think something like that is what will be needed to restore trust. And my second question, quick one, is where are you on cryptos? I don't understand them. Um, I uh, I think you're friends with Saif, uh, Safadine Amus, are you not? Are you, or have I, do no, you follow him? But I, but I like the sound of him, whoever he who, is. Uh, Sa Safadine is, uh, is someone who gave up his uh, a tenured professorship um, he, I think he's Lebanese by birth, but he lives in the United States and he had a tenured professorship for economics. He's an Austrian economist and he wrote a book about three years ago called The Bitcoin Standard. He does an amazing sort of economics course, um, Economics 101, Austrian based economies. And he left his tenured position because he couldn't stand working at the university anymore. And he thought, I'm going to set myself up as a as a, professor, as a professor of economics shop. And instead of being part of a tenured 
professorship. I'm going to be um, a professor in a university of one and it's going to belong to me. And you can sort of access his thinking and his courses by buying them online. And I've done both of his courses because I wanted to support him and he is amazing. Oh, okay. Um, I'll, I'll... And, and, he, and he is the sort of one of the big Bitcoin um, and uh, crypto aficionados. He, he really knows this stuff and I'm trying to learn it. At the moment, Bitcoin looks like a wild speculation. And I understand why um, blockchain enabled technology solves one or two of the problems that physical gold has. I haven't quite got my head around how, um, how it works and why we should trust it. Um, so I was, there's, a, there's an amazing, but do you know um, Ronnie Stoffler from uh, Incrementum in Zurich? No. Uh, in Liechtenstein. Oh, well, Ronnie writes, a, publishes a, a book or a guide or a publication every year in May called In Gold We Trust. And it's probably the most comprehensive analysis of the gold market and, and gold and its role as a monetary instrument in the world. I don't think there's any publication that is more detailed and has better essays and he for the last two or three years has dedicated one section to in gold we trust to bitcoin and to cryptocurrencies because he says they they just stand out as a as a complementary alternative to gold and so if you want to do some great reading in fact if you want to guess ronnie is an amazing font of knowledge i think i will and a very funny and a very funny ronnie i'll send you his his, his email and his uh, contact yeah details. do um so brilliant yes. oh and finally i mentioned I, I, given i mentioned at the beginning how did you get your knighthood oh um well i was part of a delegation that it was an interfaith mission that went to the island of grenada so i'm not uh, and there's a sort of story to it and um um in the island of grenada is a is a crown dependency the queen is head of state and there's a governor general and a yeah i've been there parliament that i think has it's an amazing place, beautiful. Yeah. But in 2005 and 2006, it was devastated in two successive hurricanes, which passed um, on the east coast, or the western border, where the hurricanes usually never go, and it destroyed the entire infrastructure of the country. And I mean, literally, the the, the, the whole nutmeg plantations were destroyed. The governor's mansion was destroyed. The House of Parliament was, was destroyed. The both cathedrals were destroyed. Schools everything was just flattened two years in two following years i mean it was desperate and it's a quite a poor place anyway it doesn't have mm. all the posh tourists um and um the they've been waiting the government have been waiting for first i think it was gordon brown and then um cameron to sort of make good on a promise to send them funds and to help which they never really did and they had to rely on the americans who didn't want the place destabilized to sort of pump in some some much needed cash but anyway the two archbishops of the catholic and of the anglican community reached out to friends in london um, and said we need help um, and an interfaith mission was organized you know from the two churches to support and to apply some political pressure and to, to just help raise funds um, in the interim and they wanted um or the organizers wanted a, a lay catholic and a lay um anglican and i was involved in the order that was uh, um or i knew the chap who was running it and he asked me if i would do that and i did and we went over to uh, grenada a few times and 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 helped organize that support. And in recognition of that, they, um, they took out their, um, they, they initiated their sort of order. There was an order of the nation of Grenada. And on the sort of second or third evening that we, there, we were there, we had an amazing time. Um, we were given these awards, you know, the whole delegation were given an award. Um, and mine was Knight Commander of the Order of the Nation of Grenada. And, and I thought that was lovely. And, you know, off I went and didn't think anything more of it. Um, until um, a little later, 
there was evidently a, a huge hue and cry in London and the palace because you know, Grenada had been giving out knighthoods. And it was then, it was then there was a, a royal, I think they're called a royal declaration was issued that the knighthood is not valid and not recognized in the United Kingdom which again caused great consternation amongst all the Caribbean nations to you know, have their own knighthood and orders. Um, but that's the state of play. So I don't really know whether I've got one. I mean, I've got one, <laughs> but I don't know whether it's a real one or not. So I, t I, I don't know whether to use it. I don't know whether not to use it. It feels somehow churlish not to because it was given in such good faith by the Grenadian government yeah. and by the governor general. And you know, I was invested and... It was all a lovely ceremony and my wife was there and it was it was delightful and i'm quite proud of it you can definitely um, use it when, when you're next in grenada i'd say it's completely that, kosher that, there that that's completely kosher there and I, and I can use it wherever anywhere else but it's just not it's 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 got a very strange status so it's a it's not a it's, but know, it's not a, face it it's probably worth a lot more than a lot of other people's knighthoods which have been given for services to you know the labor party or whatever so <laughs> Yeah, um, possibly. And I was going to say at the right at the beginning when we were talking about you know the, the House of the English aristocracy, there, I've always believed that the House of Lords plays an extraordinarily good safety valve function in the United Kingdom in sort of in social order, because you can take business people, yeah, who would otherwise become quite dangerous if left to accumulate un told amounts of wealth yeah and once you put them in an ermine robe yeah and a pair of knickerbockers and put a wig on their heads they become so ridiculous but at the same time so puffed up with themselves that they all the air is let out of their danger and so sort of shunting off sort of wealthy capitalists to the house of lords is a remarkably good way of sort of de <laughs> of um of of making society less dangerous from from you know um, too powerful industrialists because they they then spend all their time opening flower shops and kindergartens and and talking about things which they have absolutely no idea because everybody asks them because they're now in the house of lords rather than just concentrating on one thing which is making money mm. um, so i've always thought that's been a, a really good institution for sort of, as a safety valve for the country um, I'd love to talk to you forever, but I'm dying for a plea. Yep, and it. also, yeah, you've, I've taken up far too much of your time. But um, Stephen, it's been fantastic talking to you. And please come on the pod again, will you? And tell me more about finance. I would things. love to. And the next time I really want to talk about Genghis Khan. Do, do that thing. And um, I'm going to plug your your business on the, um, you know, in the blurb. And I Thank hope I so drive much. lots of clients your way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take All care, right. James. Bye-bye.